I'm Tass Mellis of The Starters. This is Ben Golliver with the Open Floor Podcast. Hi, I'm Kristen Ludlow from NBA Inside Stuff. I'm OJ Nanobi of the Toronto Raptors. Hey, I'm Elena Donon, and welcome to the Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Double Clutch Podcast. I'm one of your usual hosts, Mike Miller, and to jo- tonight I'm joined by Nick with a K Whitfield. Hello, everyone. Hello, how are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, how are you guys? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, and and there is another guy on the line. Yep, uh, it's Tom Hall. How's it going? I'm good. I'm freezing cold again, stuck in a room in my church, because although a lot of the campaigning finished yesterday for the voting, I want to start a new one to get me a microphone so I can do it from home. <laughs> you should have gone on the Black Friday sales. They had Yetis at a uh, dirt cheap price. Should have done that. Uh, yeah, I'll have to keep sending the links to you when they come out on offer. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you, you said it. it is election day here in the UK. Um, have you both been out and voted? Yep, first thing this morning. Yep. Cool. Yes, so I don't have to feel guilty about keeping you on the line uh, as we head t- towards the 10 p.m. mark, um, which I hope we're nowhere near that by the time we're finished. Um, anyway, a bit of housekeeping. If you're not already subscribed, please do so through your pod provider of choice. Um, it's the season of giving, so why not give us a review? If you're not following us on any social media platform or even all of the social media platforms, make sure you are. It's at Double Clutch UK on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. Apologies for the slight delay between pods. There was another pod recorded last week, but due to technical difficulties, it's been lost to the cutting room floor. We'll jump straight into it. One team that's definitely not been lost to the cutting room floor, it's the Milwaukee Bucks. So they've had 16 straight wins now. They beat the Pelicans without Yanis uh, last night. That's the... Not really much of a <laughs> statement win, but their next games are against Memphis, Cleveland, and they've got a couple of tough ones against Dallas, the Lakers, and the Knicks. They've started phenomenally. My question, straight off the bat, is are they too good? I think they're too good in the regular season. I'm not sure we're going to see it in the playoffs. I, it surprised me because I thought losing Brogdon, I thought was a massive loss for them because um, you look down the rest of the roster and they're the third best player on the team is what, like Eric Bledsoe, um, who's all right regular season. But then again, when it comes to the playoffs, I don't know if we'll see the same thing. So um, they are good, better than I thought they'd be right now. But how long it lasts, let's see. I think um, too good is an interesting phrase. Uh, too good for what, I would ask. Um, is this reflective of uh, how likely they are to win a championship I think no I think they're in the regular season I think as Tom was mentioning there they're able to um, play a lot more in transition um, and get a lot more looks at the at the hoop which is uh, something I was looking up stats on just because it seemed watching those games that there was in this streak there's been a real uh, conscious effort on their part to get looks at the hoop uh, coming into the before this streak started they actually ranked 26th in the NBA at shots at the rim uh, since then they are like right among the lead league the league leaders um, b- both offensively and defensively so in terms of uh, what they're doing um, they're making a real effort to prevent shots at the rim from the other team and get them themselves and that that's really reflected in these games they're actually winning and I think going back to what we're talking about in terms of the regular season versus playoffs I think in the regular season it's way easier to catch teams off guard to uh, they come in off the off a uh, other, few other games at a road trip and you sort of blow them out and it's game over uh, in the playoffs when people can actually calculate how other teams are playing a lot more and have a lot more leeway and play teams a lot more games in a row I think they are going to struggle to keep up this frequency I'm, I'm surprised you're both coming across as, as down on this a little a little bit into the extent you know you're not buying into Milwaukee as a uh, well, to quote Nick you know the, this this performance isn't reflective of their potential to win a championship that that really surprises me um I agree with Tom that uh Brogdon appeared to be a a, a much bigger loss in the off season that it's currently suggesting he is but I, I I mean this these this team is destroying everyone and I get that their pace is higher than first for pace in the league um but in their half court offense as well they are ex- excellent they're, they're high ranking in that and they're doing it Without a single player averaging more than sort of thirty-two minutes, what well, this blew my mind because um, Nick and I was speaking the other day uh, about 
Harden and the Rockets and and the you know the the anti load load management. And here we have a team where Yanis ranks fifty first in minutes in the league. Middleton ranks one hundred and fifteenth. So that means for Yanis, there are twenty nine teams that have almost two players averaging more minutes than him. And for Middleton, there's almost four players averaging more minutes than him. And I, it just surprises me that they're able to win games by as much as they're winning games by without having to to load up their stars with, with you know, a, a heavy shift, essentially. So I don't uh, disagree with you, I think. Uh, and I'm not saying I don't think the Bucks are good. I just think their style of play... Um, kind of like we we've seen with the Rockets the last few seasons, where they look absolutely unstoppable in the regular season, but they may have to change their style of play slightly come playoff time. Uh, watching them play the Clippers, for example, it's for the majority of the game, it's people like Mo Harkless guarding Giannis. It's not Kawhi and Paul George, which you'd see playoff time. It's it's those sorts of things that I think make a real difference. Um, and Yanis has been absolutely unreal. I've got a good stat for him. In terms of uh, the, it, it was interesting. Um, a while back, Shaq came out and said that uh, if he were to play uh, in the NBA today, his game would look a lot like Yanis. And there's actually a stat that kind of backs that up. Um, he scored at least uh, 25 points while shooting more than 50% in his last n- nine games, which is the longest streak since Shaq. And he has that kind of physical uh, absolute domination around the hoop um, mm-hmm. as much as anyone I've seen since Shaq. So what I think is harder to keep up, though, is uh, that physical style of uh, trying to physically overpower people in the playoffs when people will uh, actually use all six fouls on a number of players on Yanis and that sort of thing. It's um, can we all really have a toll on him physically, I think. Yeah, I think Giannis is clearly the best player on the team, and he's probably if you put all the Western, the Eastern team rather together, in the throughout the whole of the playoffs, Giannis is going to be the best player in any series. Um, but it's when you look down after that, it's a long drop uh, to get to Middleton, and I just wonder how do you guys think they stack up against the Phillies and the the Boston's and Torontos? Because last year we saw the same thing; they were really good in the in the play, in the regular season rather, but then as soon as they got to the playoffs. Um, Obviously, they crushed Kyrie and the Celtics, but then after that, they failed to live up to expectations. So how do you reckon they'll stack up this year? That That is my one concern um, in, in terms of... You, you've both sort of touched on it and alluded to it, is how, how they can adapt this in the, the regular season because they're winning games so comfortably now that it's, it is difficult. And I feel, I feel like I'm... I tried to take a stance and, and challenge you guys, and I feel like I'm now backpedaling. <laughs> um, but they... You know they struggled in the conference finals last year to create shots against the Raptors, and ironically, I can see trends to how the Raptors were a couple of years before that when their record looked great, but it, in in close games it wasn't very good. And if you look at the the like the clutch um, stats for the Bucks, although they are pretty good in the clutch, the sample size is tiny. It's it's third from lowest in the league in terms of times they've been in clutch games only Toronto and Washington have been in less clutch moments and one of those teams is winning Toronto and the other team is getting blown out the Wizards so it's it's really difficult to to gauge how they'll be able to adapt and play and create in a closer game um the 76ers scare me still I you know that they've I think they're 13 and two over the last 15 I might be I might have just plucked that number out of thin air and made it up but they they scare me because I still don't feel like they're clicking and when they do click Yanis isn't going to get the looks he wants necessarily at the rim because they can send Horford or Embiid that way to just put that body in front of him even Simmons to a degree at his 610 frame or whatever he is and then it's what can everyone else do? Chris Middleton, I feel like I feel like you're hating on him in a little bit, Tom. I, I mean, he is a very good player. He's just not got the personality he's cool. of it's a, just I don't know if, if he's your second best player. I'm not sure how good your team is. If he's your third, then you're probably all right. Do, do you need three big players now? You do if Chris Middleton's just number two. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> what are your thoughts on it, Nick? 
I think I'm closely aligned with Tom, actually. I, I, I do like him as a player, but I think the combination of um, what he brings and his personality means that he's not best suited for what the Bucks actually need. And I don't think they really have that guy who, as absolutely astonishing as Yanis is at pretty much everything, the one thing he doesn't have and the one thing I don't think Middleton brings either is... Um, what Kawhi has, for example, where you're tied or down one in a playoff game, you get to catch the ball uh, at half court and you have to score on this next possession. They don't really have that player, the Bucks, um, of that sort of championship level. And uh, I feel like the, the most complimentary player for Yanis would be someone who had that. Yeah. Do you, do you think Yanis is done in his evolution then or you or you just don't think he can't he can get to that position quick enough where he he is that guy because obviously the, the glaring weakness for the since he's been in the league has been his ability to shoot from range and still not great but it's up to about 32 percent. i think he's taken about five shots now per game from three which is more than double what he was doing through the rest of his career um he's starting to keep defense is more honest in that regard do you, do you just think that's he's not you know he's never going to be that guy who can who can iso at half court and then create that shot himself because a lot of his his threes he's taking at the minute are still wide wide open um i, I don't know I, I think he's he is that guy and i think if he's if he continues to improve his three he's just going to be exceptional as that guy I hope so. And let, let's be honest, Kawhi wasn't that guy when he came into the league either. And he's added that other people like uh, Jimmy Butler wasn't that guy when he came into the league, but is now. So I'd never rule it out. And if there, I don't think there's anyone in the NBA who works harder than Yanis. So. Yeah, I, I still can't go over the, the difference in his body. I know, that, I know that happens to a lot of players, but just what he evolved from as a rookie to what he is now is just, just incredible. Um, t- Tom, thoughts on Yanis as, as being that guy who is capable of icing a game from midcourt he's definitely as I said like he's, of all the people in the east he's, I think he's the number one player I don't know how many other people you could put in that team in place of Yanis, and they'd still have the same record just looking down the rest of the roster as soon as you get past the starting five you're looking at like Dante DiVincenzo, Wes Matthews, Ilyasova Sterling Brown like you're getting pretty weak as you get into the the five to 15 roster spots. Um, so he's definitely carrying the team. They've got the best record in the NBA with the with the Lakers. Um, so you've got to say he's up there. It's just where they, when you get to the playoffs, having that one lead guy with not great support becomes an issue. Um, I guess you were talking about the Rockets before. They are a pretty good um, Western uh, comparison, really, with Harden being kind of the focus of the offense. And then when it gets to the playoffs, I know he plays very differently, but... Um, they struggle, and so um, I'm not sure. I think I'll believe it when I see it. And I know they got to the West, the Eastern Finals last year, um, which is is good. But they kind of didn't get as far as people wanted them to get into the finals, and that. So I believe it when I see it. Okay, so when we, when we did the preseason uh, predictions with Hugh, uh, you went Philly in the finals, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Are you sticking with that now? Is uh, are you wobbling on it at all? I don't know. I, like you said, they're not quite clicking, uh, the 76ers, but I think if they can start to figure things out into the new year and Simmons is looking a little bit better and and Bede's not playing as Paul pogba like I said on a few pods ago, and he's more <laughs> consistent and he's dominating games on a nightly basis, then I think you've got to take Philly um, in the playoffs, yeah. Who, who do you see coming out of the East, Nick? I think if it's not Milwaukee... Um, I think I'd probably I'd favour uh, Miami or Boston over Philly at this point I think just because um, and that may change based on I think you already said Mike with Philly, Philly hasn't really clicked yet um, and I think there's a uh, what I kind of was intrigued by before the season with those guys in terms of the potential for like a just a gigantic lineup with uh, Horford and Bede, Simmons, Harris I just don't feel like that lineup is as good as it could be. There's a lot of um when they play that sort of lineup, they don't maximize a lot of those guys' abilities. Um versus uh Boston, for example, who have a lot more 
versatile uh, front court players who play a lot smaller. Um, brand of basketball I prefer, I think. So, yeah, I think... Um, and also, I think it, Miami may still have a trade in them, which maybe we'll discuss a bit later, but they have a lot of potential to improve as well. Mm. I feel yeah, like the Bucks may else. have a trade to make as well. And it's, again, it's going to be something we look at a little bit later in the pod, but uh, looking at the rest of the roster, as we just said, like they're pretty weak, so there may be some things they can do with picks and salary there to make some improvements, probably at the guard spot. Yeah, no, I think that's that's. We'll get on to trades in a minute. Um, but so let's leave the the bucks now. Let's leave them like reindeer atop of a a snow covered roof on Christmas Eve, and take a quick break to talk about our friends at NBAStore.eu, Europe's official online NBA store. We've teamed up with them to give you fifteen percent off orders with the code DCPod15. So grab yourself or someone else a great present this Christmas. Whatever you need, the NBA store has it. But to avoid disappointment, you need to make sure you order your merch in good time if you're using standard delivery for personalized items you need to have ordered by 11 p.m on the 18th of december for everything else it's 11 a.m on the 21st so lisa that's my wife to listeners you've only got a few days to get my custom nicks cap saying cap space or bust and remember to use the, the code dcpod15 it doesn't matter if you've been naughty or nice if you're planning on stuffing your stance stockings with spalding balls city edition jerseys bubble hats or scarves NBA store.eu has you covered like the NBA Christmas games will be taking care of your post turkey coma entertainment offer excludes sale and clearance items but what are you waiting for head to NBA store.eu now and use the code DCPOD15 okay so as we mentioned going to do some trade talks uh, 15th uh, is coming up in three days time so what's that going to be Sunday uh, is when the restriction on new signings is lifted and they can be traded and 30% of the league is basically on the market Tom, to quote you, you had some trade <clears throat> ideas you wanted to get off your chest. Yep. So I'll let you lead this. Where do you want to go? Just to give a bit of background, I flipping love trades. I, I'm the guy that when, <laughs> when I play 2K, I could quite easily sit there on my GM, not play a single game for about five hours and just trade and do free agency and all that stuff because I just love it. Sadly, more than the game sometimes, but never mind. So you're the kind of guy who'd appreciate a uh, football manager for the NBA. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Yeah, someone needs to get on that. Um, but, well, there there is one, but it's not. A f- it did have the NBA at one point, but now it's not got it. I'm trying to think. I'm looking around for it now. I've got I've got a copy of it somewhere in my room. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll let you know what it was after yeah, you pick it up for about a tenner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think the plan is I kind of looked through a few trades, some that I've come up with myself, some that other people have suggested on different podcasts and articles. Um, I'll put them out to you guys and you can give me your ya or na verdict. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, are you up for that? Yep, sounds good. Let's do it. Great. So the first one, this is something suggested by Kevin O'Connor from The Ringer um, in his article a few days ago. He was saying that there's been quite a lot of interest in Danilo Gallinari, who's at Oklahoma City, Um, power forward who's playing really well. Um, he's on the last year of his contract, I think, and obviously we all know Portland have been struggling um, at the forward spot, hence why they've brought in Carmelo Anthony. Um, but what do you guys think about sending Gallinari to Portland? My immediate reaction is just what Portland need, another guy who's susceptible to injuries. He is an incredible talent. I wonder how he'd fit alongside Carmelo because... They seem to be stuck with, well, not stuck with. They seem to be fixed to him for now. I think they're guaranteeing his two point eight million contract, which isn't a lot, to be fair. Um, you, you you suggested him going back for Whiteside, didn't you? Is what you said yeah, in the chat as, earlier. Just a salary filler, really, because Gallinari's on. He's close to twenty million, I think, and Whiteside's up there as well. Baysmore, you could throw in. He's on a little bit less. I think he's on like nineteen. Um, but it just depends. They're yeah. so weak at the at the wing spot now. They probably want to keep Bays more. I know Rodney Hood got injured the other day, so he's now out for the season with an Achilles injury. So they're even more um, stuck for roster spots than they were before. I mean, I'm all up for shifting uh, expiring contracts to get a return. I'm I'm not I'm not sure in time. He would be. I'd love to have him playing for the Blazers, but I'm not sure he's what they need. Yeah, do you think if they did it, do you think one first rounder would be enough? Obviously, OKC, okay, they're in complete re- uh, rebuild mode, so um, they'd be looking just for any positive future asset they could get, I think. Um, well, I, 
the way their season's going at the minute, I would not want to trade a first round pick if it's going to be for this yeah, year. <laughs> I think they've got all their first round picks going forward, so you could chuck in a later one if you're thinking things are going to get better. Yeah, maybe. <sighs> Nick, Nick, what are your thoughts? Well, this is an interesting one for me. I think uh, Gallinari is uh, one of many NBA players who I later realise I have a complete irrational love for. Um, <laughs> Do you want to move into I the think, Knicks? Do you want another power forward? Well, it actually, <laughs> it dates back to the fact he played for the Knicks and was one of our best players for some time. Um, but this would also create the uh, pairing that I'd hope to see in New York with, uh, as Mello came from Denver, uh, Gallo actually got sent to Denver and so that whole thing of had Mello waited for his contract to run out and then join the Knicks when they actually could have kept all the talent, um, that was actually a combination I was really looking forward to seeing. So from that perspective, I am all for it. Um, from an OKC perspective, I think the combination of Stephen Adams, uh, Hassan Whiteside and Nerlens Noel uh, potentially all sharing the floor at the same time is an absolute abomination but some <laughs> is also something we deserve to see as NBA fans so sign me up there's a, there's a lot of expiring money in that one so I mean if if you're the Blazers now I as much as I don't think it he's really what depends they need. what is OKC doing what are they trying to do it's very unclear what their goal is I think they're just seeing how it goes this year but if anything comes up past the 15th into January then they're going to take it surely if the if the pick if there's a pick going back and it's decent you you would bite your arm off because is is he realistically going to stay in OKC um and they won't next pay season him. they wouldn't want to give him money exactly and then who who they got coming back you've got Whiteside who is only expiring and so is is Baysmore so if you get a pick out of that, that's better than having nothing, I guess. Uh, from from Portland's point of view, you you need something to hit. Whiteside is not working at the minute um, and is being slandered for it. So, you know, yeah, why not go for it? The problem is if they get rid of Whiteside, then they've literally got nobody at centre until Nurkic comes back. Um Small ball, go yeah, five out. Do it. It's fine. I'm up for it. <laughs> They've basically got no one at centre anyway because Whiteside only plays half the minutes he's on the court. Um, guys, but... guys, what are you talking about? Mario Hazonia is still there. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. <laughs> that inside presence. I, I, I got, I bought a little too much Mario Hazonia stock in the preseason and then immediately uh, regretted that speculative investment. It was, I might as well have just set fire to things instead. Um, let's go next. Next trade. Okay, so the next one. Um, a lot of Chris Paul talk. I was wondering whether you think a Chris Paul to New York trade could work. Obviously, sorry, Nick, the uh, the Knicks aren't going to get anyone in free agency. We all know that by now. Um, so why not try and get Chris Paul on your team? Get rid of some of the salaries you've got now. So Marcus Morris, Portis, um, just get them off just to match the salaries up and then throw in Frank Tillakina as well um, as the, the positive assets for OKC. What do you think? Uh no. <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you hoping for? I want I actually uh, d- don't get me wrong, I like Chris Paul uh as a player. He's still good, but I want no part of that contract. That's something that is the worst instinct of the Knicks franchise is to make that trade. So that's a strong nah for Nick. What about you, Mike? It it does kind of fly in the face of everything they pivoted to say they were trying to do by you know getting money off the books for 2021 by getting a guy who is going to be owed over the well he's owed 38 and a half million this year then 41 next year then 44 the year after that that's a toxic contract it is but would, who else are they going to be paying realistically well for what for what benefit is Chris what's Chris Paul going to do still, to New he's York? He's still good, and he's gonna he's a famous face to have there. That's better than just the the crap they've got there at the moment. Sorry, <laughs> they, they don't they don't need him. They sell out without a famous face because people just love New York. Um, I'd also rather go. Chris Paul is good enough to actually win some games as well, even with a bad roster. I'd rather be full Sixers process and uh, just get loads of draft picks. So we're we're both down on that one. Two strong okay, fair enough. 
Uh, yeah, very strong. Uh, go on then, what's your next one? Okay then, for the next one, um, let's do some work with CJ McCollum because he's far too good to be playing in the uh, shadow of Damian Lillard. So can we get him to Philly, do you think, for a Tobias Harris trade uh, with a Heat 2021 pick as well? Uh, I, I'm almost tempted by this because I'm... I, I still I think the biggest downfall of that Blazers team, their biggest weakness. Forget all the injuries. Uh, we saw their we we saw, let's take their last year where they were sort of the height of their abilities, and they got to the conference finals, be it slightly luckily. Um, undersized backcourt. That's just, there's only so far it can go. So if they're bringing in someone with more size, I like Tobias Harris a lot. He's not great from three, but I lo- for some reason I love his pull-up uh, elbow jumper. Um, I'd be tempted. And you dangle dangling the 2021 carrot. So two years away, mm, this Miami team look they're, like they're about to click and they've got a lot of young pieces, so it could well be just a, a, a really late first rounder. Uh, I, I'm hedging towards it. It's definitely something that I'm, I'm nibbling at. And I think that Philly team really needs some uh, ball handling as well. Obviously, they've got Ben Simmons, but we all know his shot's not there. So having CJ there, I think, could put Ben Simmons cutting a bit more off the ball. And then, obviously, he could stand on the perimeter and knock him down as well. So what do you think, Nick? I think this may be your finest hour, Tom. I am far more on board with this than Mike was, I think. I think uh, it works for both teams. I like the fit uh, of the players in the different teams. I I already said earlier, I don't think Philly is maximising the talent they have uh, because there's too much overlap between Harris, Horford and Embiid in particular. Um, And so I think Harris would show a lot more uh, playing for Portland. Um, Probably kill Mello a little bit. Sorry, Mello, but... Uh, it would definitely be a strong move for them. And I completely agree with you. McCollum would add a lot of playmaking for Philly um, and give Ben Simmons a lot more of those inside touches that he's actually really good at. That kind of um, means there doesn't have to be such a focus on did he shoot a three in this game or not, which personally I find a bit boring, but it seems to be uh, what the kids love these days. So Nice. Yeah, so two yep. two yards for that one. Too happy, uh, happy to go with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a yard. You've piqued my interest. Nice. I think it's one of those that we really like the sound of, but I I'm not convinced we see anything on that scale happening. Um, but we'll move on anyway. We'll stay with uh, CJ McCollum. What do you think about, we mentioned earlier, the books maybe needed to make a trade, um, and their strongest guard at the moment is Eric Bledsoe. So what about if we did something with CJ going to the books? Maybe throwing Middleton the other way? They've got some picks as well that they could dangle. What do you guys think? If if I'm the Blazers, I take this trade. Do you? What else are you asking as I well? I take as this trade. Um, oh, because I don't. I, I think McCollum is a lot better than than Chris Middleton. So you're probably going to get some assets back so as well. You really don't like Chris Middleton, I do, I do you? I really like McCollum as well. <laughs> See, I I think we've got a a guy here who is more off the ball, certainly, than CJ is, brings a lot more size and strength in terms of defensive presence, um, can shoot from anywhere on the court. Just, I I, I don't think, I, I, I don't think there's that big of a gap between the two of them. If you're sending back picks as well, because you, you're, you're I, do you know, if you're the Bucks and you're, and I, I, I would absolutely rinse you on this trade because you clearly really don't like Chris Middleton. <laughs> um, I, I think I'd take this trade if I'm the blaze. If I'm the Bucks, I'm walking away. I, why? Why would I do that? Why would I give up size? Uh, but could you guy, imagine uh, McCollum uh, and Giannis on the same team? Yeah, who's getting the ball? Because we've seen part of some of that issue is like we we see with Dame now. Dame and, and CJ have to have the ball in their hands. Um, to, and, and that's one of them's got to give up something and CJ's probably going to give up the same again when he goes to uh, if he went to us if he goes to uh, in in Milwaukee I I, I don't know I, I, and I just think then defensively you know this is a number two ranked defense you take CJ you're taking a step back from that and like he's a great player but I really think you're undervaluing uh, Mr Middleton mm. any thoughts Nick I 
don't have a strong opinion on this one. I feel like the end result is neither team improves significantly. They kind of both stay at a similar level. I'd be intrigued with um, Middleton in a different uh in a different setup just because I, I have a feeling for example he might be a good small ball four um that would work really well in portland and i think he'd probably show a bit more um the thing that kills it for me though is just with as we've already talked about how well the bucks are playing i don't think they do anything to shape chemistry or uh, mix their team up so that's the main thing that kills it for me um but no it's an intriguing one Okay, so we'll move on. One more that I just want to throw out um, that is a bit of a weird one, but we'll go for it. What about DeMar DeRozan moving to Minnesota for Andrew Wiggins? I feel like it's a one-way trade. Which way? To a, <laughs> well, actually, now I've said that out loud, I've suddenly like panicked on it. Because uh, if, if I'm... I, I think it works for Minnesota to the... Shall I give you my reasoning no, for don't. it? No, don't. So I'm yeah, thinking, so if you're Minnesota, you're looking for more scoring to put around town. You want to show him that you mean business going forward before he has to leave. So you bring in DeRozan. Yeah. Um, if you're the Spurs, then you're looking for some kind of direction going forward. It might be worth, it's, a, it's an expensive flyer, but you could take a flyer on Wiggins, who's looked a lot better this season. Fingers crossed he can yeah. keep that up. And obviously the Spurs system is renowned for making most players look better. Um, so if they could get prime Andrew Wiggins going, um, it could work for both teams. I don't know what you think. This this could be Pop's saviour. The you know if he if he does turn, if he was able to turn Andrew Wiggins back into the player he should have been when he was coming into the league. I completely get your reasoning from being in in Minnesota, and the fact that DeRozan doesn't want to shoot anything from perimeter doesn't matter for Cat who can easily hit seven threes in a game if he wanted to um, yeah I think I'm on board with this because the Spurs team their core if you want to look at what their core is going to be going forwards it's not going to be DeRozan and, and Aldridge mm-hmm. yeah that's the thing I wrote a, f- uh, about a couple of weeks ago now I think about what kind of direction some of these teams are going to be going in and the Spurs I can't see him completely blowing it up with it being Pops last few years. I think they've got too much respect for him to give him a crap team. Um, so it's whether they can kind of muster a, a new direction and um, a jazzed up roster on the fly. Um, Wiggins could do that. It's a bit of a risk, but I'm not sure. What do you think, Nick? I want no part of Andrew Wiggins <laughs> is uh, my general <laughs> philosophy. I, I think it would. I'd love it from Minnesota's perspective. I like DeMar DeRozan. Um, I just think it would be the ultimate example of a sell high on a particular player. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. Wiggins' best season. Um, he's younger than DeRozan. Um, I think I'm. I don't think Pop would want Wiggins either, based on. Uh, and obviously, this is speculative, but what you hear about his work ethic and his lack of love of the game and that sort of thing. Um, but I, as I always say, I, I hope Wiggins proves me wrong and everyone who says those sorts of things about him wrong. But I think it would be a very risky move for the Spurs as well, who are not a kind of uh, risky or risk-taking organisation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's definitely high risk. Um, but <clears throat> you know what? If it's his pops last couple of years, they're going to have to gamble somewhere because the way they're trending now, that it's... <sighs> they're going to struggle to to reinvent themselves without hitting the the skids first really can you imagine popovich's face when the front office guys all walk in and say oh oh hey pop uh coach of david robinson tim duncan (laughs) manu ginobili tony parker we want to send you out on a high we've got andrew wiggins (laughs) here for you (laughs) yeah that's a fair point uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I just I just think constantly that that the value of DeRozan and, and Aldridge is going to go down. They've missed their their chance at, at trading them and getting a uh, you know the returns from now on are always going to be reducing, and it's 
that at least there's some potential there that if Wiggins maintains this, they could flip him later on. Let me put it a different way. If this trade was um, LaMarcus Aldridge for Wiggins, I would be all for it from a Spurs perspective. But DeRozan, what is he, 28? Um, I still feel like, depending on how many years Popovich has left, DeRozan's still going to be really, really good for those seasons. So I feel like you, if anything, you're trading down. Yeah, I'm not sure Minnesota takes the Aldridge deal just because, as you said, like, how old he is. Yeah, no, DeRozan I agree. is 30. 30, okay. So 30. let's say Popovich has two years left. DeRozan's still going to be probably as good as he is today in two years' time. Which in this league is what? A guy who refuses to score from the outside and just, you know, isn't capable of leading a team far in the playoffs. I'm looking forward to the, uh, the backlash from Hugh, the resident Spurs fan. I think Hugh knows it. That's why he's not come on today. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> All right, one more, one more trade. Do you want one more? One more trade. Okay, I yeah, could go for more. an hour, so we'll, we'll do one more. Um, I'm going to do one and a half. Let's combine two. Uh, ben Simmons, if we're getting him out of this Philly team that's not really clicking, what do you think about either Ben Simmons for Jamal Murray in Denver or Ben Simmons for Kyle Lowry and OG Ananobi? Purely just because Larry is a bit older, so let's throw in OG as well. I, I actually like both of those from Philly's perspective, which sounds like blasphemy towards Simmons. Uh, but from Denver's perspective, I don't need a uh, ball-dominant guy who won't spread the floor and allow no, uh, allow Jokic to uh, to make his fantastic passes. Well, assuming that is, you know, Jokic actually decides he wants to bother playing again. Um, for the Toronto one I think Ben Simmons and Siakam as different as they are are similar players in terms of they they like to slash drive uh, Siakam obviously shoots more from outside because he's averaging more than two, three points as made in a season um, but I think o- OG Ananobi would be a huge piece for Philly that, that already scary defence could be Really, really scary. And then Carl Lowry, ball distributor, helps you spread the floor. Uh, uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on it. I think they're one-sided deals. I look at Ben Simmons for Jamal Murray. I don't like Ben Simmons in Denver, kind of like Mike was saying, because part of the problem he has now is that he's on the same team as Embiid. Um, and Ben Simmons, I've said this a number of times, he essentially needs to be treated like Yanis. I'm not saying he's as good as Yanis, but... He needs to be on a small ball team where he can get all the post possessions he wants, all the drives he wants, and the bigs are keeping the space under the rim there by spacing the floor with threes. Um, Jokic can do that, but I don't know why you'd sacrifice a huge part of his game. So I don't really like Ben Simmons in Denver. Jamal Murray in Philly, I think he'd probably do the same thing he does in Denver. He'd be good. Uh, So I'm probably a no for that one. Um... Simmons for Lowry and OG, that's a really interesting one. I think I love it from a Philadelphia perspective, uh, and that's not to say I don't like Ben Simmons. I really do like him. I just think he's hasn't found the right team and the right setup for him uh, to be literally as physically good as he can be. Uh, but I think the veteran presence of Lowry and as good as he still is and uh, what OG brings would be phenomenal for Philadelphia. I think they would immediately move up to my favourite team in the East at that point. Uh, ben Simmons at Toronto. Marc Gasol has kind of become Brook Lopez as he's got old, but better defender in terms of he shoots so many threes. So he could definitely have that role. But yeah, I think you're sacrificing a little bit of Siakam. But I think I could be convinced by that one. Yeah, I like the idea of the, the Simmons, Siakam, Van Vliet, starting lot for uh, for Toronto. I think that gives them the new direction that they're after. Obviously, Siakam's the main man at the moment, um, but since Kawhi has left, they're playing well. They're not. I don't think they're heading anywhere near another championship. But Simmons certainly gives them that new direction moving forwards. No, that that, that was a, a pretty good section. I enjoyed that. Lots of trade talk. Um, if you guys agreed, disagreed. Uh, Tweet us, contact us at Double Clutch UK, email us admin at Double Clutch UK. Uh, let us know some of your trade suggestions and maybe we'll pick them up on the next show. 
Uh, let's move on to a, a topic that I'm going to approach with the same enthusiasm as the Grinch that stole Christmas. Let's talk some New York Knicks. They fired coach Fisdale last Friday, Friday afternoon. Um, Nick, your thoughts and reactions? Uh, it's not surprising. And to be honest, uh, the, the, I think the quality of basketball is as hell has been as bad as any I've seen um, in my many depressed years as a New York Knicks fan. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think it's surprising and I find it hard to say it's a bad decision either. I think my general outlook is that the role of the coach is to put players in scenarios in which they can succeed. I think if you look at any of the kind of what you consider the better coaches in the NBA, they're incredible at doing that. If you look at um, uh, Popovich, we've already mentioned, uh, Rick Carlisle with any of his teams that have contended, all of the players are essentially overachieving. Um, you look at this, uh, and even uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Nick Nurse as well, when you look at what he's done with the Raptors and guys like Van Vliet and Siakam, how much they can improve under him. Um as well as many other NBA coaches I could bring up. But you look at um, the Knicks this season, it's obviously um, not a orthodox or exciting or good roster, but there's pro like Morris is probably the only guy actually playing better than you've seen him play elsewhere. And that's only because he's become the primary scorer for this team. If you look at Julius Randle or... Um, even Dennis Smith, um, no one is playing as well as they've played previously. So that's a system thing and that's a coaching thing. So uh, I, I I think it's hard to say it was a bad decision. Um, I think uh, the roster gets criticised a lot and uh, kind of rightly so. I think um, if you look in isolation at this roster, any one of, actually no, most of the vast majority of these players on the Knicks could contribute to a very good team. Uh, they just aren't a good fit together. Um, but I think they th there's still the potential for this collection of players to be much better than uh, by far the worst team in the NBA, which is kind of what they've ended up as. So, yeah, I, I don't think it was the wrong decision. I, I kind of feel too... <laughs> I kind of feel like he wasn't given the best tools needed to succeed and that's on the front office they you can't go out and expect expect miracles well you can maybe you can go out and expect miracles but that's unrealistic and that's probably why the Knicks are the way they are um you, you mentioned role players role players on successful teams are important obviously but the reason they are in those positions and doing so well is because they have a player ahead of them who is able to elevate their abilities and these guys just don't have it i don't think he was was able to um have control of the the locker room there must have been some you know it's got to be tough for guys losing and constantly losing and being blown out you know i think didn't they concede in in one half the same amount they scored in the total game the date from the day before or something crazy but to, to me I'm not convinced Fisdale is a, a, a good coach. I mean, we've seen him now in, in Memphis as well. Uh, obviously, he, he he was in Miami and everyone has an assistant. Everyone spoke about how he was a player's player uh, coach, everything like that. Guys really buy into him. Well, Mark Gasol sold him down the river in Memphis and now this in, in New York. So I'm not convinced that he's he was ever good and I don't think we'll ever get a chance necessarily to see him prove one way or the other. But I just think to it's e it's easy to fire the coach, but the problems are way more systemic and and above Fisdale's involvement. Yeah, from what I've seen, like people love Fisdale as like a motivator, um, but in terms of his like tactical noose, um, he's just not up there. And that's that's where Mike Miller stepped in has been a lot better. Um, nice one, Mike. The commute's killing me. <laughs> But um, I mean, the confusing thing for me is when they've been losing, when they've been down big in these games, he's still been putting out the the role players that they signed in the summer and not giving the minutes to the young guys. So uh, Tilakina and 
and uh, Barrett and Robinson and others. Barrett's been playing a lot, to be fair, but then you've got the likes of Kevin Knox, who he was horrendous last year, but he's still young and he's got a lot to uh, to develop. So you'd think they give the minutes to them, um, but it's just not been happening. Um, so the coaching's not been great, but as you said, Mark, I think the the problems are further up. Dolan is obviously the main issue. Um, he just doesn't care if they're any good. Well, I think it was ESPN put a t- tweet out, and I can see it now because a lot of people are using the same pick of him sort of leaning back in his chair. And it was over the last 20 years, the Knicks have the worst record throughout the NBA at 40% wins. The only two consistents in that time are Dolan and Steve Mills. So, what? <laughs> it's, that's horrible. <laughs> yeah, I, I think... Um... Yeah, I mean, that's undeniable. You can't debate that. But I I still think, um, I don't think that's a separate point to coaching, though. If you looked at, um, let's take another uh, widely accepted franchise that's been traditionally considered to be badly run. Let's look at the Charlotte Hornets. If you looked at that Hornets roster uh, before this season, and after 25 games, you're going to tell me you predicted they would win more than twice the number of games as this Knicks roster would. You are lying. And that, that's been the difference between a coach who's really overachieved with what he's got compared to a coach who I think is underachieved. And that's, again, that's not to say I think this Knicks roster is good or anything like it. But behind teams like um, the Hornets or the Cavs even who we're sort of basically tied with it's kind of pretty dire to think that this roster couldn't do better than that no, I, I get your point I think that's I, I think that's a, a fair point um and uh, I just I, I just think that the you get rid of the coach fine Ch- change your coach fine but there are bigger things that need addressing as well and I, I don't ever think that Fisdale would have been there by the time the Knicks you know, let's say everything goes to plan, and in 2021 they've got this this cap space and they use it well. I don't think Fisdale was ever going to be the coach that was leading them at that point. Agree, and I, I think and one thing that kind of doesn't get talked about enough is everything, um, uh, and in some ways rightly so, is always doom and gloom around uh, talking about the Knicks because of how bad the record is this season, all the rest of it, but. The thing I think only Knicks fans really get is that the most depressing thing about being a Knicks fan is when the team was constantly mortgaging the future of the team, uh, desperately trying to salvage a bad situation, where right now the situation we have with all of these random players we've picked up for one and two seasons, they all come off the books after next season. So, and pretty as I was saying, like pretty much all of them could contribute to a decent team. So all of them are movable as well. So the the fact there is potential in the next few years to be better is actually bizarrely a positive as a Knicks fan. That is the question. I think if you get to the end of the season and they've not traded any of those pieces and they just let them expire or take the second year option on them, then that is a, almost a bigger failure than not landing any of the big names in free agency. Okay, so let's let's quickly uh, let's look get your takes on who you think is next to be fired, because someone else is going to go. Have to. I'm a bit worried about Atlanta. I mean, their roster look really exciting coming in. I know they're young, and that's their that's their excuse. Um, but they're six for nineteen at the minute, um, and so hmm, I'm not sure whether he'd be fired or not, they're definitely disappointing, as are the Pelicans in the same way. Obviously, they're waiting for Zion to come back um, and they've got a similar kind of young makeup of, of players, um, but not pulling off the results they want to at the moment. So I'm not sure. I can't see Gentry leaving the Pelicans either, um, but they're definitely disappointing. I, th- I think Gentry's got some time from uh, uh, just, you know, Zion and no one expects them to be good, even, you know, no one expects it to be this bad either. Uh, Lloyd Pierce in Atlanta, I think that's a great shout. Um, Trey Young seems to be having a relatively abrasive relationship with him. Obviously, they're missing John Collins as well, so maybe they're waiting to see what happens when he comes back. Um, cause what are we now? Game t- Oh, we- they've-, they've played 25, so he had 25 game ban, and it came after what three games in? Was it? it wasn't far into the season, so he should be back. Who knows? Maybe by oh, Christmas. I've got the obvious one actually. Um, I'm going to go for Jim Boylan as my number one pick. 
at Chicago. <laughs> you, you just named sorry, three. Sorry. Let Nick name one. Jim Bullen's my man. <laughs> Jim, <laughs> Nick, who have you got? Yeah, I think uh, in Atlanta, I think, as you already mentioned, I think John Collins will, uh, they will dramatically improve once he's back. So I see them, uh, th- their trajectory going upwards. I The one I pick may surprise you, but, I'm gonna actually gonna to go to for a team who I think I and a lot of other people had high hopes for this season, and they're playing borderline just over 500 basketball and look very uh, incoherent offensively, which is the Utah Jazz Ooh. Uh, Ooh. and Quinn Snyder. I feel like so they're sitting at sixth in the West right now, um, with the Suns waiting for Aiton uh, and a few other guys to come back. Um, the Kings look like they're slowly improving. So if the Jazz took us even a slight downturn, Mike Conley's looked nothing like the player he was in Memphis there. Um, so um, Joe Ingles, couldn't remember his name then, uh, is, his, his role has basically been taken by Bogdanovich. Um, and they don't really have kind of they they're in desperate need of three and d guys but they've they've almost got too many playmakers who aren't amazing off the ball uh rudy gobert was unhappy at the start of the season not getting enough touches he's since improved but yeah i just think there's something there where the organ if they took a slight downturn the organization may think about that i think i think it's a good shout um if i recall correctly i had him down as coach of the year potential because I was just expecting so much from this Jazz team this year, and they just have not delivered at all. So I, I complete, I'm completely on board with with that being a, a potential move they make. Although traditionally, um, I think they're one of those teams that, when it gets into the second half of the season, they really get into their stride. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, but I don't think they've. they've I, I just feel like the the expectations were significantly lifted yeah. this year for them. I mean, I I, I remember there being talk about top two in the conference you know one of the best defenses in the league full stop and then Connolly has obviously been a disappointment coming in and and taking some of the load off of Mitchell and it just isn't isn't clicking um but yeah you, they do make the second half of the season push when you know half the league has decided to pack it in for the season um you mentioned Boylan <laughs> that's that's got to be on the cards very soon absolutely has to be um as I said earlier, Hugh was supposed to be on the pod today. Uh, he was—he uh, actually wasn't. I'm just making this up, and he doesn't know it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, he was going to double down on his preseason prediction where he slandered the balls and took some slack for it, but he couldn't get his headphones on because his head was that swollen. Um, but any uh, any other coaches you want to throw out there as potential? I, I've had three, so axes? I think I'll reserve myself. You've had three, yeah. I think I think we've probably covered it, unless Nick's got another one. Uh... Just because we're um, slagging off Hugh for not being on the pod, let's sack oh, Popovich as well. Let's sack Popovich <laughs> too. That's what I thought you were going to go with when you said uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to surprise some people. Okay, so let's move on to some, some trivia. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned at the start of the show that it is election day here in the UK. So um, although we are apolitical on the podcast, um, in the words of Skunk Anansi, everything's political. So we've got a politics-themed trivia for you. Politics and NBA, obviously. Let us know how you do. Um, I'll give you guys. There's only like three questions and a bonus question, so it's going to be it's going to be short. Remind me, do we have to beep um, them? So I'm going to. Well, yeah, okay. you just co- give me your answer, basically. Uh, I'm going to give you three options, actually. Uh, then you can decide how you want it. I'll give whoever calls okay. it first gets it. Wrong. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Should we? Okay. Should we do though? If you call out an answer and you're wrong, you can't just yeah. keep, get frozen out. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. do that. Of course, that that goes without saying. Although it's worth saying, so people actually know what they're playing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, which former Phoenix Sun? Was the mayor of Sacramento between 2008 and 2016? Kevin Johnson. Was it? Ooh, straight off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. One nil to Nick. Was it Dan Marley, Kevin Johnson, or Tom Chambers? Yep, Kevin Johnson. Let's try and make this um, a bit harder. Uh, which former Detroit Piston was elected to complete the unexp- unexpired term of 
Kwame Kilpatrick as mayor of Detroit in 2009 and was then elected to a full term later than that, later that year. Was it John Sally, Dave Bing or Joe Dumas? John Sally. Frozen. Dumas. Also frozen. It's Dave Bing. Wow. Got a bit harder. <laughs> and <laughs> Okay, this one is possibly easy for one of you. Uh, Which member of the New York Knicks title-winning teams served three terms as a Democratic senator for New Jersey? It was Bill Bradley. Uh, Yeah, okay, that's cool. I don't need the options. In fact, Tuna, you don't need the options. You don't need the options. (laughs) Uh, So (laughs) the options you had were uh, Dick Barnett, Dave DeBoucher, and Bill Bradley. Now, bonus question. So we'll play it even though it's 2-0. Everything rides on this bonus question. Bill Bradley spent a year at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar in 1965. Whilst he was here, he played for a European team. Which one? Your options are Milan, Panathinaikos, or Barcelona? I think it's Milan. (laughs) It is Milan. I I remember reading that somewhere. Yeah, yeah, Wikipedia, I imagine. Um, No, I definitely... uh, had that i don't know where i first picked up that he was it must have been one of the books um i'm trying to think which book it is i'm looking at my shelf now but i remember reading he was a Rhodes scholar and just being like wait what (laughs) and yeah pretty cool after he graduated he was uh, over here studying and then he went on to have a ridiculously you know successful mba career followed by a ridiculously successful political career um fair play to him that uh, that wraps that one up you you got absolutely hammered there that was a sweet i think that's two losses for me now two for two Oh man, you need to work on your trivia. But that was that was a little bit tough, and it was a little bit themed. So who knows? Um, anyone got anything they want to say before we close up? I think uh, I'm disappointed at myself in that trivia round, and I clearly need to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you went John Sally as if as if he's ever been a mayor of anything. He's been like a bit part actor in Bad Boys, and that's it. And maybe on wasn't he on like the American version of I'm a Celebrity or something? Yeah, at I, one was, point? I was. I was. I, I was actually before you said the options because I was thinking it was John Sally or Bill Lambeer because I thought he did something as well but I'm obviously wrong he, he might have done but he was not mayor of Detroit in 2009 um, cool alright uh, well thank you to everyone for listening thanks to you two for, for joining um, Nick where can people find you on Twitter at MJ Whitfield Tom uh, Tom Hall 789 excellent and uh yeah please leave us a review please follow us on everything that you could possibly follow us on uh we like that even though it can be stalkerish uh it's at double clutch uk we'll catch you next time thank you very much for listening good week cheers bye